Hello there friends and welcome to the second installment of our study of heaven. Uh, this book by um, Alcorn is the uh, outline, if you will, for our study. Randy Alcorn supplying um, a lot of the um, uh, scripture and, and uh, organizing the study, I think, in a very good way. Uh, I don't um, often refer to the book simply because I don't have permission to use it in that way. Uh, yet, yeah, I've applied for it, but uh, we'll wait and see what the company says. Uh, by the way, if you are uh, thinking of purchasing this book, a copy of this book for your own use, um, I was at Barnes & Noble yesterday and, and noticed that they had two copies there. The book was uh, is copyrighted 2004, so the fact that it's still in print and still available, I think, probably speaks to its um, popularity, at least, and, and uh, it is a good book. So uh, I think the, the quality of the book was part of the reason I wanted to do this in the first place. Let's begin, as always, with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, on this uh, blustery afternoon, I want to pause and thank you for your watch care over us, for your kindness to us, and um, for the fact that uh, as good as things can get in this world, uh, they never approach uh, the way things will be in heaven with you. So, Father, open our eyes, our hearts, help us to uh, receive in our spirit all that you want to give us through your Holy Spirit and to uh, have a vision of heaven that transforms the way we look at this world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And indeed, we would uh, have even more cause for worry about the condition of this world and the, the status of things going on in our own country, uh, community, maybe even in our own homes, if we didn't know that there was a place beyond that. So, uh, chapter 2, uh, Alcorn asks the question, is heaven beyond our imagination? And I think part of the answer must be yes. Uh, it's simply too good, too great. Uh, and our faculties for understanding um, it are, are going to be limited just because we all have limits. Um, and also by the limit of Scripture, that God didn't tell us everything in Scripture. He told us what He knew we needed to know in order to be saved. And so there's, a, there's enough information there, but it isn't always uh, information uh, that, that we can uh, readily understand or make use of, uh, and we'd always like to know more. Um, but... I think part of what we, uh, part of our answer is, uh, if it is beyond our imagination, nonetheless, we need to use our imagination. And so, what Randy Alcorn argues for in this second chapter, uh, I have put here on page three of our study, what we need is biblically inspired imagination. So, not an imagination that says, I'm just going to make stuff up, uh, but instead an imagination that takes what we learn from the words of Scripture and tries to picture uh, how that might be. And um, certainly the writers of Scripture uh, had to uh, have imagination to describe the visions that they had uh, so that they could put into words what God was saying to their spirit. So with all that preface, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Psalm 119, verse 18. Now, Psalm 119 is uh, about the law in general. It's the longest chapter of the Bible, and it deals with uh, the psalmist's love of God's law. So verse 18 is very much representative of this chapter. Here we read, Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your 
law. Now, this is offered as, a, as an example of a figure of speech. Um, is, I asked the question, is he referencing his physical eyes or is he talking uh, more with a figure of speech? And I think it, obviously it's a, it, well, it's, it's not uh, only a, um, a physical sensation. Uh, mo most of us don't need help to open our eyes. Um, so he's using it as a figure of speech, but then so his eyes will read the words on the page and they will have an impact. Normally you and I use that expression, open my eyes, as a figure of speech for make me aware or give me an answer or help me understand. Um, and so the, the psalmist here is making a plea to overcome his preconceptions, his assumptions, his bias, and all other limitations that we as human beings can have and uh, cause us to overlook the truth. This psalm is a love letter to the law, and so we can assume that the writer longed for a better understanding of the law. In fact, he wanted to see what he called wonderful things. He assumed that there are wonderful things in God's law. He also assumed that he hadn't seen them all yet. And so this is a prayer to God for assistance. Now, um, even when we're talking about the law, uh, things that we would normally think of as being matters of black and white, words on a page, um, it, the use of a figure of speech here um, gives us reason to think that imagination plays a role. So we hear the law, um, and one of the ways that we apply the law is we imagine ourselves in a situation that law covers. So we're told the, by a sign on the street or the road what the speed limit is. Well, we, we immediately imagine what that will look like on our speedometer or what that will be like as we drive at that level or limit or less. So how might God assist our imagination? If we, if we think that uh, this psalm is a plea for God to help us see things that we don't normally see, that's imagination. And um, we're asking God to give us words to form an accurate figure of speech, to give a, a brand new thought to us. How many times have you had the experience of, of going to God's Word, even very familiar scriptures, and a light comes on, figuratively speaking, and you see something there that you didn't see before, a new truth or a new angle on a familiar truth and wow that's a great experience and so I believe that's what the writer of Psalm 119 is praying to God for. Let's go to Isaiah 64 and verse 4 where we have the um, prophet uh, making a similar comment, uh, not about himself, but about all people. And uh, this uh, section of Isaiah is a section of praise and prayer. So he's saying something praiseworthy about God is his action on behalf of his people. And in verse 4 he says, Since ancient times no one has heard, nor I perceived, any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Well, I ask the question on page three, what value do physical eyes and ears have in perceiving God? Well, there are occasions in scripture where God acted in this physical world and uh, either indirectly, if you will think of the times when the nation of Israel was led by day by a column of smoke and by night 
by a column of fire. Those were physical things that people perceived with their actual eyes. Um, at times, God has spoken in an audible voice. Think of the baptism of Jesus when a voice from heaven was heard to say, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Um, physical ears received those sound waves, and the brain converted them into words and were understood. So on those occasions, there's an obvious benefit to having vision and hearing. But on other occasions, and, and I think more likely in this one, uh, the author is using poetic license to describe what we would say is a personal awareness of God. It's not an awareness that is achieved through vision or hearing, but it's achieved through the Spirit and is a sense of God's presence. Um, now I ask the question here, what more do we need? Do we need more than just our physical senses to appreciate God at work in our lives? And I think, yes, obviously. And he's using a, a figure of speech here. He's saying since ancient times or since the world began, um, you know, no one has seen any evidence that any of these idols are real, that they have done anything on behalf of those who wait upon them. So that's, a, uh, that's not a fact that Isaiah can prove. He's simply stating it as a, a, an imaginative way of saying, um, you know, we perceive God spiritually. Now, next we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. And this is a section of Scripture that has a lot of debate about what it is Paul is describing here, um, its meaning, and, and really what does it tell us about heaven. So here's what the first four verses say. And we may come back to this passage on more than one occasion since it does deal with heaven. Uh, verse 1, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that a man is not permitted to tell. So our first question is, what's this about a third heaven? And what we know about heaven is that it is God's throne. Jesus said so in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 34, we'll just briefly note that, and as I'm looking it up, I'll remind you that there are scenes in Revelation uh, that, are, that deal with the throne of God, and that's in heaven. Uh, 534, um, but I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or continuing into verse 35, by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the great, uh, the city of the great king. Now Jesus here is not talking about heaven, he's talking about swearing oaths, and he's discouraging the practice. Uh, and he's saying, don't, don't swear by heaven, because that's God's throne, and that's all we're establishing uh, there with that verse. It is the place of of his presence. Now, why should there be levels to heaven? And people have taken some different approaches in trying to answer that question. Uh, you've heard the expression about seventh heaven, 
honestly, I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't think there's a good answer. Um, uh, in short, I think Paul is making reference here to um, something that the Jews believed that has not really carried over in the church, at least not in our time. Um, what's, uh, what else is interesting in, here in verse 1 is that he refers to visions and revelations. And we, we think, okay, is that, are those synonymous? Is Paul being redundant here? And I think the difference is a vision it has a, a visual component. It, it, you're either actually seeing something with your eyes or you're perceiving something as if you were watching it, like watching TV is, or your computer as you are doing right now. You're not actually perceiving me, you're perceiving some pixels on a screen that uh, look like me. You're hearing not my voice, but a computer reproduction of my voice. So. Um, revelations, I think, may or may not be visual. Um, sometimes uh, revelations, I think, are well, more generally, are just thoughts that occur to someone. Like, um, you have, as I said before, you have a sudden insight, the light comes on, oh, I hadn't thought of that before. That's a revelation. Um, the difference is slight, however. Um, Consciousness of God, what he's saying here is that consciousness of God eclipsed awareness of anything else. And it's not that Paul couldn't describe what he experienced there in the body or out of the body. Uh, God knows. Uh, why he felt he had to repeat all that twice is uh, going to be a matter of guesswork. But his reluctance to talk about what he saw in paradise um, does not mean that we should be reluctant to talk about it. Because in this situation, Paul was told, you're not permitted. He was not allowed to try to describe this. Now we compare this, as I promised, with Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. And uh, so... Did Paul have a vision and John had a revelation? Is this an example of the difference between the two? I don't know. I, we could make that point. Um, revelation 4, 1 to 3, reads as follows. After this, I looked, I meaning John, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first, I first had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And he had, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So, first three verses of chapter 4. Is John unwilling to share what he saw? No. Neither is he forbidden from saying or describing what he saw. As a matter of fact, toward the end of Revelation in chapter 21, and verse 5, we're told this. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So John here is not only not denied the opportunity to describe his revelation, but he is commanded to write it down and record it for us. So, how do we reconcile these different approaches to heaven? Paul versus John. And I would say that God treats all of us individually when his will dictates. 
He forbade Paul from describing what he saw in the spirit or in the body, um, but he gave no such instruction to John regarding what John saw, and he made this very pointedly clear, in the spirit. He went up to heaven in the spirit. Paul didn't know whether he had gone spiritually or bodily, but John knew that it was a spiritual revelation. So I, I think this simply means that um, God's will is going to dictate a certain path. He's going to follow that path. His will will come to pass, and we shouldn't make a big deal out of whether it was a vision or a revelation, whether there's um, any act of imagination involved. Just assume that there is. Next we go to Isaiah again, this time chapter 55. And uh, that part of my Bible has gotten pretty worn for some reason. Isaiah 55 and verse 9. Now this is a call to have faith. And so Isaiah wrote, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, that verse is often plucked out of context and used to justify different things. If we put it in context, um, what, what's being talked about here is repentance and God's grace and what Isaiah is trying to communicate to us in that verse is that God's grace is so wonderful and the fact that we can repent time after time is so profound we don't really understand how God can be so merciful. So that's Isaiah's point here. He's not talking uh, directly about boy we can't know what God's thoughts are because his thoughts are so much greater than ours. We can't follow God's ways because his ways are so much higher than ours. That's the opposite of what Isaiah is trying to say here. He's trying to say that God lifts our thoughts so that we share his thoughts. He guides our ways so that they become his ways. So I ask the question on page 3, does Isaiah 55, 9 discourage us from imagining heaven? And believe it or not, some people have used this verse to discourage the use of imagination in thinking about heaven. No, is the answer. It is, is not about that really at all. It calls us instead to recognize the limits of our imagination and on the other hand to recognize the limitless knowledge and power of God. Yes, we do not have in ourselves the power to know the mind of God or accurately describe the spiritual things of God, um, but again the emphasis here is on repentance and grace. Not about heaven, not a general statement about what we know and don't know other than uh, God's knowledge and ways are higher, but he makes them accessible to us by his grace. So rather than forbidding, Isaiah 55 encourages. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, and the, the context here is what we refer to as the Faith Hall of Fame. And uh, we're all familiar with what a Hall of Fame is. It's a place where people who have achieved things are memorialized. Um, Paul takes a break in the middle of this uh, Faith Hall of Fame. And in verse 16, he... Uh, well, let's read 15 and 16. Uh, go back to 14. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. That's people who did not live by faith. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, as Abraham left Ur, uh, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, 
they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. For what were our ancestors of faith looking? And here the writer makes it plain. They were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Now heaven is not uh, really best understood as a version of this world. Actually, this world is a version of heaven. And we've seen people who will twist their fingers and make all kinds of shapes uh, on a wall uh, with the shadow. And uh, that's really the way we need to understand the relationship of heaven to earth. Heaven is the reality and the earth is the shadow or the shape of that reality. So they were looking for a heavenly place and God was not ashamed of them, the text says. And he showed that he was not ashamed by preparing a city for them. And we know what that city is. It's the New Jerusalem that is de uh, described in Isaiah and in Revelation. Um, they saw this as uh, the greatest reward possible for their service to God. And um, we go back to verse 10 to find out more of that city. So Hebrews 11.10 says about Abraham, For he was looking forward to the city without foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abraham was looking forward to a better country, a heavenly one, a city without foundation or with foundations, built by God. That's heaven. One more place to look, and that's Colossians. And chapter 3 and verse 1, where Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he says it again in verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Verse 3, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, also appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Now, starting in the very next verse, Paul is going to go through a list of things that the believers were supposed to put away, all kinds of vice and sin. But the reason that they should do that is that they, by faith, by the God's grace, they have a place in heaven. And so his command to the believers is not to ignore the topic of heaven, but instead fixate upon it. Set your minds, your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. And where is Christ seated? At the right hand of God, but in the throne room of God. And where is the throne room of God? But in heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Now that phrase, set your heart on, literally translated from the Greek is seek. Seek. Now let that sink in a minute. We are to seek heaven. It is to be an object of our attention and affection, not to replace Christ, but knowing that Christ awaits us there. And this commitment must shape all our decisions. It must change us into the image of Christ, where he is at the Father's right hand. So I would say 
that makes it imperative that we study heaven. That's my phone ringing. We'll ignore that for now. Turn over to page four, and let's just briefly talk about these questions for discussion. Some people equate imagination with untrue, that they're very pragmatic to, uh, to a fault and think that if it's imagined, it can't be true or it's not likely to be true. And I would say that's absolutely false, that that's not always the case. Um, there are things that exist that we cannot perceive with our five senses. Uh, you know, if the wind's blowing outside, I don't see the wind. I see the tree limbs moving. I see the clouds moving. I don't see the wind. I can hear it if I'm outdoors. But um, we, we need to be able to perceive things that are real um, but are not perceptible to our senses. So, when do we use imagination to describe the things we've seen? Well, mainly when we're remembering it or embellishing upon it. Um, we don't need imagination in the moment that we see or hear something, but in recalling it later, uh, sometimes imagination is necessary for recall. Uh, if you've heard the song, I Can Only Imagine, you, you hear the songwriter saying that heaven is something that uh, we only experience in part now. We experience it emotionally and by faith. And so imagination is necessary. Imagination is what brings scripture uh, to life. It makes it personal and even more real to us. Uh, some, thing, some people think scripture and imagination are contradictory forms of information. What would you say to such a person based on our study today? Is there something wrong with people imagining what might make heaven heavenly for them? What heaven would be like? And I, I say again, the answer to this question is no. Within reason, we need our imagination to see heaven at all, to make it more personal, more real, and more desirable to us. Um, if it's okay to say so, can we share things that make heaven heavenly for us? And the answer is absolutely, yes we can. Uh, Jesus promised the thief on the cross a place in paradise in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Uh, if that word does not refer to heaven, what did Jesus promise the thief? I believe that the word paradise often, if not always in scripture, refers to heaven, unless it's referring to the Garden of Eden. And if heaven is paradise, how does that help us imagine what paradise would be like? Well, we can imagine places on earth that we've been or we've um, heard about, and um, it's getting darker. I'm going to have to wrap this up. We can use our imagination to describe them and thereby understand heaven better. And as long as our imaginings of heaven don't take our eyes off Christ, then it cannot be a bad thing. And in fact, I would suggest to you that we use our imagination every time we open the Bible. Think about Jesus healing the paralytic who was let down through a hole in the roof. How can you read that scripture without trying to imagine? What did that look like? How did the people around respond to such a sudden and surprising intrusion? Um, what was the expression on Jesus' face? Uh, how did the paralytic look and what did he do when he received his ability to move? Uh, I think imagination is crucial. But what's important about imagination is that it always submits to the limits of the words of Scripture. Thank you for being with me today. In a couple weeks, we will go on. There you go. To uh, chapter 3. And a very important question. Is heaven or hell our default destination? Are people going to go to heaven unless they mess up? Or are they bound for hell because they're messed up?
We'll talk about that next time. Thank you.